Nevada Week took some of Lieutenant Spencer's concerns to State Attorney General Aaron Ford. Here's how he responded, followed by what process he says is in place to determine the best uses of $71 million in settlement money to combat Nevada's opioid crisis. We did an interview with Lieutenant Ray Spencer of Metro's Homicide Division recently, and he talked about the increase in homicides last year, attributing it to what he said is easy access to guns and in particular stolen guns. I'm wondering what you think about that issue, what can be done about it? Well, he and I absolutely agree that Las Vegas has a, a gun problem. Um, you know, we have worked with our um, partners both at the federal level and at the state level and at the uh, municipal level to try to figure out ways in which to uh, curb gun violence, but access to guns um, uh, is, is an issue. Uh, but particularly, it's an issue for those who shouldn't have guns, violent criminals, domestic abusers. And so uh, we want to ensure that we can do all that we can to help um, keep those individuals from getting access to guns. And that includes having responsible gun owners like myself, for example, uh, to, to lock up their guns and to, ensure that they're, to, and to ensure that they are secure. And Lieutenant Spencer did mention ex-felons being in possession of guns, and I'm wondering if it's possible that these ex-felons could be prosecuted at an even higher level. Yeah, well, again, working with our, our partners, we have uh, federal prosecutions on that particular issue. We certainly have district attorneys around the state who will be prosecuting uh, felons in possession of, of firearms. They're not supposed to have them, uh, and when we learn that, that they do have them, they absolutely should be prosecuted. The lieutenant also talked about the extensive criminal histories that he's seeing in homicide suspects, in particular one suspect who had 151 prior arrests out of the state of California before getting arrested here in Nevada. Is there anything that can be done at the state level between states or is that just wishful thinking? Certainly not wishful thinking, and I think there's obviously a communication uh, gap oftentimes between the, uh, the, the different states and, and jurisdictions in our country, and we could always improve in that communication arena. Uh, but again, when we're talking about um, ex-felons or ex-offenders who are in the possession of, of firearms, they're not supposed to have them. And it, it's incumbent upon us to ensure that when we run across those types of individuals that we, uh, that we address it properly, uh, which includes prosecutions. I mean, you can't really track people across state lines, can you? There are certain uh, registration rules and requirements for certain uh, felony individuals who, who go across states. Sex offenders, for example, have to register when they arrive in a new location. So there are ways to, to track certain offenders as they move in between states. How do you differentiate the need to come down hard on certain criminals or help to rehabilitate criminals? Listen, I don't think those things are mutually exclusive. You can come down hard on violent criminals while at the same time doing our job in the penal system, which is to also rehabilitate them. Uh, most of these individuals will, in fact, be reentering society. And so it remains incumbent upon society to help ensure that they are ready for reintegration. Uh, and that's the reason why, for example, we have educational classes in the prisons, a bill that I sponsored. Uh, one of the ways that they can get they can get a um, they can get course credits towards an associate's degree. That's one of the reasons why we have vocational training in the prisons because again it's a recognition that these aren't mutually exclusive. You have to punish those who are the wrongdoers, but you likewise have to prepare society and them, uh, the individuals who have uh, committed these these crimes, for reentry into society. And do you think that the reentry aspect, the need to rehabilitate criminals, is a requirement that is understood by the general public? I think the general public, as a general matter, does understand the importance of rehabilitation. Um, look, in law school, we learn that there are four or five, depending upon what book you're reading, uh, purposes of the criminal ju justice system, of the criminal law, uh, to, to punish, which we're very good at, uh, to isolate, which we're very good at, but also to rehabilitate and also to restore. Uh, we're very good at the first two, not so good at the second two. And so what we have to endeavor to do is to continue uh, to do our job, irrespective of you know, those who want to use pejorative terms like soft on crime or whatever the case may be, I'm going to do my job. And my job is inclusive of all four of those uh, approaches to the criminal justice system. Are those last two aspects personal to you? Well, they're all important to me uh, and they're all personal to me. I went to law school. I took an oath uh, in this particular job to, um, to pursue justice. And justice includes the punishment component, but also the restoration component. And they're all equally important to me.
You've said in the past that Nevada continues to be one of the hardest hit states by the opioid crisis. Why do you think that is? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the recent trends relative to that, frankly, have more to do with illicit drugs uh, than they do with the initial onset of opioid op overdoses that we saw, which was um, distribution and manufacturing of pills. Uh, and so we've seen fentanyl coming into our uh, into our state. Uh, we've seen a lot of deaths in that regard. In 2020, during the uh, height of the pandemic, we saw a 40% increase in overdose deaths, uh, many of which are attributed again to the illicit use. Uh, but what we're doing through the opioid litigation is attack attacking the issue from one prong. There are several prongs to this, fentanyl being one of the prongs that we're also working with law enforcement on at the district attorney level with the uh, and, and at the federal level to ensure that there are criminal penalties for those who are selling, for example, uh, fentanyl-laced uh, drugs uh, and, and causing deaths. I see our, our, um, um, our partnerships there, uh, again, are looking at this from a partnership perspective so that we can understand that, you know, it's not a one-shoe-fits-all or one-size-fits-all approach to addressing this, um, uh, but some of it relates to the pills some of it relates to the illicit use. And am I understanding it correctly that the people who are getting fentanyl are thinking they're getting opioids and then it turns out to be a mistake and then they die as a result? In some instances, I mean, some are pursuing fentanyl because they want fentanyl, right? Uh, but oftentimes people are buying pills that they think are opioids and those opioids are laced with fentanyl. Uh, one pill can kill. That's, that's one of the mantras that we're trying to instill within children these days because we're also seeing it happen in, you know, in our middle school and our high schools. And so uh, educating individuals that is frankly, not just the pills though, is also important. Sometimes fentanyl is laced in marijuana. Uh, sometimes it's laced in methamphetamines. Uh, and so there are uh, um, um, so many different tactics and approaches that we have to be cognizant of and we have to address and working again in partnership with local officials and, and federal officials is one of the ways to do that. You mentioned foster children and that stuck out to me. Is there a significant impact on foster children as a result of the opioid crisis? Well, I mean, we know that again, families have been affected by this. You know, if a, if a child's parents uh, or parent um, falls prey to an overdose, a fatal overdose, then that child likely becomes a foster child. Uh, and, and we have a foster care system that has um, likewise uh, reeled from that particular uh, uh, impact that opioids has had, and, and that's just an example that I provided. Not that's it's, it's exclusive to uh, um, something else, but I do know that there is a great concern about how the foster care system has been impacted, and I do know that these funds, w which will be given to the state, will, will likewise be utilized um, to address some of those issues in that particular system. Back to the opioid settlement, why did you pursue these drug companies? Well, they did so many things, and, I, and our, our lawsuit is hundreds of pages long. It includes, it included 61 defendants. And we have about 50 left now because we've settled with a handful of them. Uh, last month, we were able to bring in 50 million more dollars to help address this issue. By the end of next July, we will have brought in another 20 million. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, this lawsuit um, seeks to hold those accountable, whether they are the distributors, whether they are the manufacturers, whether they are uh, the pharmacies that were uh, improperly dispensing medications in this in this instance, um, we want to hold them accountable for the work that the, for, for the work that they did. I mean, we even have held accountable that consulting company that helped um, other companies you know, increase the, the pill mill approach, so to speak. So. Um, you know, these individuals have, have, have lied. Uh, they downplayed the addictive nature of opioids. Um, and they essentially had you know, are the reasons why these pills ran amok in Nevada, in one of the hardest hit states in the whole nation. So how much money is Nevada getting in these settlements? And it's already been determined how much money each county and litigating city gets, but how is that money going to be spent? It was a, a cooperative effort. My office, in fact, took the lead to ensure that we could convene uh, the counties and municipalities because this isn't a, a state-only issue. It isn't a Clark County-only issue. It's not an, an Elko County issue or, or a City of Ely issue only. It's a statewide issue. And so we convened representatives from all over the state to talk about a fair allocation of monies that we would re were to receive in because there's a limited pot of money, to be sure. Um, and so we wanted to ensure that there was a fair allocation model that we set up and we were able to accommodate that, uh, to, to um, accomplish that through what we call the One Nevada Agreement. And I'm proud that we ha have signatories throughout the entire state on it and it makes it easier for us to settle with some of the larger defendants because then they know that you settle with the state, you settle with the entire state. 
You don't have to worry about other municipalities suing and, and then continuing to dwindle against the pot uh, that, frankly, not only uh, Nevada needs, but other states as well. Um, your second question was, how is the state going to determine how the money is going to be spent? It goes back to what I said a second ago about the Committee for Resilient Nevada. Um, you know, I, I I'm, will be bringing home the settlement funds and making no decisions relative to how the money is spent. I will give it over, give it over to uh, the legislature, uh, which created a committee that's going to be run by the health, Department of Health and Human Services. Um, this isn't an ivory tower committee. This is a committee of folks who are working on the ground, whether they be doctors, uh, addiction specialists, social workers, uh, members from the foster care arena, um, um, service providers, and they will be coming up with the needs assessment. And then I would believe by the end of the summer, uh, they will have a better understanding of how the monies are going to be spent based on the needs assessment uh, that has been created. Um, the one that's out that I will make is that I do chair the Substance Abuse um, Working Group uh, and SURGE, as we call it, uh, and we are able to make recommendations to the Committee for Resident Nevada uh, in these same areas. Based on that experience, what would your recommendations be? One of the reasons why foster care came to mind was because we, we, we hear a lot about that in that committee, whether it's in public comment or, or whether it's from uh, if people who are on that committee. Uh, we also want to ensure that there is an equitable distribution uh, among um, you know, different demographics in the state uh, because it has hit um, certain communities, hard, uh, communities harder than others. And I go back to why do you think Nevada was hit so hard? Is it a demographic related issue? I don't know. I don't know if we have a causal connection uh, between, uh, you know, some particular, um, um, you know, issue that happens in Nevada and, and that ultimately led to, to this being the case. But we know that it is the case. Um, and we know that some of it was because, again, of the targeting of, of places that, I mean, we have some rural communities that received um, more, more pills doled out uh, than the entire population, which doesn't sound abnormal at, at some level, but I mean in multiples, right? I mean exponentially. And so um, that, that we, we have determined through our discovery, we, we've gone through terabytes of information, uh, dozens of depositions. Uh, we've put in hours upon hours of work uh, to learn that some of these companies were absolutely targeting particular communities because these communities appear to be more vulnerable relative to uh, the advertisements that, that they put into that particular community and the response to those advertisements. And so I, I don't know um, what it was about these communities or our state that, that made us one of the um, um, most targeted places, uh, but they worked, it worked, and we're going to hold them accountable for it. How do you think these settlements will impact the company's behaviors? Well, it's already impacting their behaviors. Um, one of the consulting companies uh, that, I, that I mentioned earlier is no longer um, working in the arena of consulting on opioids. Uh, we have uh, what we call injunctive relief in place that are going to require uh, certain companies um, to, to never distribute again uh, in this particular, you know, these forms, these forms of pills. Uh, we're going to have a database of documents that allow us to hold others accountable that we may not already know of. Uh, and, and I think that, that the, the actions uh, that, that, we're already see, uh, that we're already seeing change uh, are a direct result of some of the summons that we've had, and we're, we're proud of that.